It's our turn, episode number 82, Unique Games. In this episode, Annette and I talk about the most unique games we've ever played. This is the Dice Tower Network, adding games to your wish list since 2005. Hosting for this episode is generously provided by our fantastic supporters on Patreon.com. If you'd like to help us out by pledging $1 per month or more, please visit Patreon.com slash Our Turn Podcast. Every dollar helps us to keep this show going strong. Hi, and welcome back to Our Turn. I'm Kathy Ford. And this is Annette from Netter's Place. Hi, Annette. Hey, Kathy, how you doing? I'm good. Welcome back. Yeah, I'm always glad to come back to your show. So I'm excited because today we're going to talk about unique games, which, you know, every game is unique, but I'm excited about the criteria we've come up with. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But first, we always start the show off by talking about what we've been playing lately. So Annette, what have you gotten to the table lately? Um, Lately, I've been playing Pioneer Days. I haven't heard of that one. Oh, okay, because it just came out. It's a tasty minstrel game. This game is all about the West, and it's a dice placement game. So, Oh, those uh, are fun. Dice drafting, and then you place your dice. So you generally, um, the theme is that you are pretty much a pioneer in the old Western days, and you're you're engaging with people and you're loading them onto your wagons and such. And you obtain them, they give you special bonuses and stuff. Uh, along the way, you might pick up some equipment. You might need to pick up some medicine. And you might need to pick up some food and some cattle and such. Because along the way, in the pioneer days, there was always tragedy. And uh, there's these tragedy tracks that you know, that also happen. And they occur occasionally in the game several times. And so the the cool thing with this game is that uh, I didn't expect it to be as fun as it was. <laughs> I thought it was just going to be some silly little like dice drafting game. And, and come to find out, like, I've really been enjoying it a lot. And I've the theme makes it so easy to teach as well. And everyone I've taught it to has really enjoyed it. You know, I've been surprised by how uh, deep a lot of the dice drafting games are, like um, Sagrada and Role Player. Yeah. They really get your brain going. They seem really simple, but... Yeah. And the thing is, like, dice are generally known as, like, really random th- items to have in a game. They make the game so random and... I don't generally like dice in games, but lately, like with Pioneer Days and like you said, role player, uh, I've really been enjoying the dice and the puzzle that it brings. Um, Mm -hmm. With dice drafting in this game in Pioneer Days, it brings along a player interaction. So if you have four players, you're going to randomly draw dice from a bag and then you're going to roll them and then you draft. And what you pick, you get to do several actions with. However, if there's four players, you pick five dice, that last remaining die is going to move the tragedy track. So one of the markers is going to move and either uh, a raid can come in and steal half of your money. Um, You can have a famine where all your cattle uh, will die unless you pay for them to be uh, fixed (laughs) or kind of, uh, uh, you have some disease that may happen, which may kill the people that you've acquired unless you have enough medicine to give them. And so it has these tragedies that you could prepare yourself for, but you're not sure like which die is going to be left over because everyone's picking and choosing the ones they want. You might think someone is going to pick this one, but they might end up screwing you in the end (laughs) by taking the wrong one. So you could be perfectly prepared for a plague and then get hit by marauders and have all your people killed that way. Right. (laughs) In which case, the medicine's not going to do any good. Right, right. So you're always having to prepare yourself for tragedy. But then again, you want to win, so you always want to collect as much stuff as possible. (laughs) Nice. So... um. 
Yeah, it has a lot of player interaction. I've really been enjoying it. That's uh, Pioneer Days. It just came out a few, like a month ago, I think now. And it should be available soon everywhere, I think. I think it's in all retail stores now. Was it a Kickstarter? It was. Oh, it was okay. a Kickstarter. Okay. So um, this copy I got, I actually, uh, Tasty Minstrel sent it to me. And I did a, a overview of it for Board Game Breakfast. But um, the reason I just like I, I made that video so quickly was not only because they gave it to me, but also because I enjoyed it so much, uh, and I didn't expect to enjoy it that much. <laughs> so I had to like talk all about it. <laughs> so, what is your rating on the OTP scale? Um, I give it a four and a half. Oh, which nice! Is pretty high. I know. I think it's a really solid game. I've played it multiple times now. Um, I've gone through uh, different strategies. Uh, it has variable players, like starting players that you can have. So it always changes. It has different decks of people that you can acquire. So that's also variable. So every game has been different from one game to another. And how many people does it play? It plays two to four players. Have you played it two player? Does it do well? I played it with two players. I played it with three players and I played it with four players. And it does well at all player counts? All player counts, yeah. Nice. Yeah, nice. I really like it. A two players, it's actually a lot more strategy to it. There's a lot of luck, but you can always mitigate those dice too. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's Pioneer Days. Yep. So what have you been playing? Well, this one I actually talked about back in 2016, which was the year that this podcast started, uh, I recently acquired a copy of Imhotep. Okay. And I got to play it for the second time. I initially uh, played it originally at Hadecon in 2016. In fact, the only two games I played at Hadecon that year uh, are now on my shelf. <laughs> and that's Imhotep and Castell. Uh, I wanted to get a copy of this. And so when I saw it at a flea market, still in shrink wrap, I picked it up. In Imhotep, you are all builders in Egypt. And you are trying to build the best pyramids, the best burial chamber, the best obelisk, the best temple. And basically, you're trying to place your cubes in such a way that you get the most points. Some of the uh, stone placements are scored right away. Some are scored at the end of a round and some aren't scored until the end of the game. And whoever ends up with the highest score is the winner. There's some take that with this game because you're loading your stones onto these boats, but the boats can't be launched until they have a certain number of stones on them. So for example, a boat with four with room for four stones on it can't be launched until it has a minimum of three stones on it. And remember, in Egypt, these are supposed to be big stones. These aren't just something, you know, that's easy to move. Then uh, there are boats that have three spaces. There are boats that have two spaces. And there's uh, one boat that has one space. And you have to have this requisite number of stones on it. But you're not the only one placing stones on these boats. Other people are too. Other builders are. And... Your actions in the game are to take a stone from the quarry and put it on your sled in front of you. And you're only picking one color of stone. So, for example, uh, when I played it the other day, I was brown. And uh, Mark was white and Frank was black and Dwayne was gray. That's how you keep track of whose are whose. But your actions are to take a stone from the quarry and put it on your sled take a stone from your sled and put it on a boat, move a boat to a dock, or to play a blue card. There are cards that you can spend stones to get that will give you points later. Blue cards are played as an action. Red cards are played right away, and purple and green cards are scored at the end of the game. There's a lot of strategy in this, particularly in when you choose to move the boat. And you can choose to move a boat that doesn't have any of your stones on it. So when you move it, you could move it over to the obelisk and unload somebody's stones onto their obelisk spot. And that could totally screw up what they were planning to do. <laughs> um, so there, that's where the take that is, is that you're messing with other people's plans. Um, if you go ahead and move it to, say, the burial chamber, 
they could be okay with that because that scores, I think the burial chamber scores at the end of a round. And it's however many of your stones are showing based on looking down from above. And I think in that particular one, you want to try and arrange it so that as many of your stones as possible are touching because the more stones that are touching, the higher you score, the more points you score. Anyway, it's interesting. It's got variable scoring uh, depending on where you're building at. And it goes for, I want to say, three rounds or four rounds. And it's just, it's a lot of fun, but it's really easy to learn. But it's very deeply strategic. Um, You're trying to figure out, you know, how you can score points for yourself and not give points to to your uh, opponents. And when you dock a boat, you also get to unload it, but you have to unload it from the front to the back unless you have a card that breaks that rule. And so you could place your stones in such a way that when you unload the boat, you're actually messing up their strategy for, you know, linking up several stones together or it's just a fascinating game and I can't wait to get it to the table again. I think I came in third on this one, which, you know, that's not unusual. (laughs) But uh, I really had a good time with it. And I'm looking forward to exploring some of the cards that are in the game a little more. And just, you know, like I said, exploring this game a a little bit further. Uh, Right now, my initial rating of it is a four. Okay. Um, But I think that could possibly go up with more plays. And the expansions coming out at Gen Con. Oh, I saw on Board Game Geek that there was an expansion. I didn't realize it wasn't out yet. Yeah, it's coming out soon. So I nice. really w- am looking forward to that because I, I really enjoy Emhotep. It's super simple, like you said, and you can easily teach the game and get involved with it. As as soon as you show them, like, you could do this, you could do that, you could do this, now let's play. And the strategy is like, once people realize what you can do and how you can like like kind of take that with other with your plays, oh man, the player interaction is like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I I really enjoyed it. So mm-hmm. uh, I highly recommend Imhotep. It was designed by Phil Walker Harding and is published by Cosmos. It's been out since 2016. Yeah, and that's what we've been playing. Friends, I want to take just a few minutes of this episode to thank you all for your support. This year has been particularly challenging for me as I have dealt with depression and several pretty big life changes. I have been reminded by friends and family that when life becomes overwhelming, it's important to take a step back and indulge in the necessity of self-care. This, for me, meant dealing with the immediate situation in front of me and gaming and podcasting, had to get unexpectedly put on hold as time and energy just weren't there. I want to thank you all for your patience and your support on our various social media channels. I also want to issue a special thank you to our Patreon supporters because you stuck with us during this time. Figuring out how to pay for everything that's involved in keeping a podcast going was not an issue I had to deal with. That really means a lot to me, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Life is settling down now. Mark and I have moved and gotten new jobs that we are learning and enjoying. We've gotten back into gaming, both board games and role-playing games, and things are looking up. I plan to ramp back up to our weekly production schedule, but it may take a bit of time as I pull the whole gang back together and get us back on a schedule. Again, my thanks for your patience and support. For today's hot topic, Annette and I are going to talk about our favorite unique games. Now, what do we mean by unique games? Well, we initially talked about this when we were discussing doing this particular hot topic. And what we agreed upon was a game that is one of a kind in regards to art, theme, or mechanisms. Now, it can include all three, 
or it can include two of the three or just one. So I'd like to say that it was unique when it came out because it could have been cloned or copied since then. So what do you think about that, Annette? I think that's a fair statement to, to make. I think okay. I think as long as it was unique for its time, things always evolve too. Exactly. Now, you've got some uh, other criteria or suggestions that you got from Twitter. Yeah, I did also ask Twitter uh, the question, what is a unique game to you and what are some of those games? But um, I have this response from Girls Game Shelf. And they said, when I think of a game that is unique, I think of how cleverly the theme is tied into the mechanic. Mm -hmm. They say also that I feel like that's incredibly tricky and difficult to pull off. I imagine so, yeah. Yeah, and I also have a statement too. Uh, This is also from... uh, Madbona, and she mentioned, uh, interesting question. At first, my immediate response is me- mechanism, make it unique. But when asked the last question, what is most the most unique game? I thought of the grizzled because mainly of the art and artist who is no longer with us. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So an experience, uh, an impact that the game might have had uh, to you can also be a, a form of, of a unique game. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, and this isn't one of the games that I'm necessarily going to talk about, but the very first game that ever made me go, oh, wow, that's beautiful, before I even played the game, was Euphoria. Mm -hmm. And after that, I started looking at artwork in board games and taking that into account when judging a game. Until then, the artwork had kind of been incidental to me. Of course, that was pretty early in my being a board game hobbyist. Yeah. Uh, Another one that I could probably mention, because at the time that it came out, it was unique, is Robo Rally. I had never seen a game before that had the programming aspect of Robo Rally. But now I know Colt Express does the programming. Right. Mechs versus Minions. Mechs versus Minions is the other one that does that Mm -hmm. programming as well. But I feel like they've kind of taken that programming aspect and maybe taking it up a notch yeah but at the time robo rally was unique yep. yeah I, I think all of those are good i mainly focus a lot on mechanisms okay so a lot of the games i'm going to talk about are have something a little bit different in mechanisms and i i think most of mine were pretty much that way too yeah okay. yeah absolutely um, I think mechanisms is probably an easy one to latch on to mm-hmm. and tying the th- the mechanism to the theme, right? like uh, Girls Game Shelf said. So what is the first one that you wanted to talk about? The first one I'll go over is a fairly recent one. It's called Chimera Station. Chimera Station is a game and the theme is pretty much that there's all these workers that work in this one station out in space. And they do a lot of laboratory testing and genetic testing, and they evolve themselves. And then they do oh. um, they do different tasks as a worker placement uh, in the game. And so the cool thing with this game, though, that makes it so unique and different are the components, which um, is uh, an added part to like the artwork. But um, the components in this game are the actual workers. You can clip pieces onto them. So they're kind of like Legos in a way. Um, So if you have a worker, it's made up of two halves, the feet and the leg and the head. And then you can break them in half and then you can add on something else. And now that worker has evolved genetically (laughs) <laughs> oh wow! Like in the theme, and then when you place them on a certain spot, they have an added bonus depending on what was attached to them. So yeah, it's a it's a regular worker placement. So you have different locations, uh, these different tiles that are randomly coming out, and you can achieve these, t- uh, gather these tiles, place them on the main board. When you place them on the board, whatever you cover up, you get special bonuses from, but also it becomes available locations for the workers to go to. Uh, these workers that you have, you'll be able to place them in these certain areas. And so if you go to this certain location that gives you money, then you'll get money. However, if you have genetically mutated where you have these, these sticky hands like tentacles, then your worker can actually obtain a little bit more money and then you can (laughs) add 
more tentacles to it, and then you'll have even more money that these little, you know, hands get stuck to. <laughs> oh, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, so it works with that.、Uh, there's not just the tentacles, but also the brain. You can attach a brain. To these workers, where they obtain more that could be、points. important. Yeah, because they're smart. <laughs>、uh, another thing is that you can also have claws attached to these workers, and that means that if you have a worker of an opponent that is at a location that you want to go to, well, then you just claw your way through、uh, to that location and kind of shove them off. <laughs> so it works thematically too. But、um, what I really like is the component. Uh, feature in the game, it's just a basic worker placement. You put your workers down, you do what it does, what it says to do, but because it has these added component parts to it, it makes it a lot more fun. And it's still thinking enough, and it's still、uh, a medium weight game where you're kind of having to pick and choose what you want to evolve and where you want to go with that evolved creature. Wow, that's interesting. I haven't heard of that game before, and I like the aspect of. Being able to build your character's presence on the board physically, I like that. Yeah, it's it's a game. I don't think I've seen like manipulations of of actual workers.、Um, I think recently there's been a tiny epic quest where you have your little meeples and they can obtain weapons. You can add them physically to your little meeple, but that's a lot different than actually changing the form and the look of your worker. Right.、Mm-hmm. Right. Changing your your worker on a genetic level, yeah, <laughs> and the theme is really fun to play with too. So nice, that's one I hadn't heard of.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's really good. I don't, I think it came out last year, and、uh, I haven't heard much too much about it. I mean, there's so many games that comes out like constantly.、Oh, yeah. So yeah, just nice to shine the light on that game too. <laughs> you put in the show notes here. 2016 was the year it was published. Oh yeah, or maybe it came out like late 2016. I think it came out in 2017. The, the it was on a Kickstarter, and I backed the deluxe、oh, version of it. Okay, okay. So maybe that's why it's 2016. But I got it last year from Kickstarter. Okay, all、mm-hmm. right. The first game that I want to talk about is Photosynthesis. A, I love games that. Use science. I mean, this is growing trees. You are basically growing trees on a board that is in a little bit reminiscent of chess because you're trying to block the trees of your play of your opponents so that they can't get any light. So they can't get light points. So light points are the currency in the game to help you grow your trees and then harvest your trees. For victory points, and it it just it reminded me a little bit of chess, where you're trying to outmaneuver your opponents and、uh, grow your trees in such a way that you get light and they don't. <laughs>、um, but I thought it was a great way to introduce the concept of photosynthesis to you know a great way to explain it to teenagers and you know older children who are probably learning about it in school right about now. And it is a fun game. It's very strategic, and、um, and a little bit of a brain burner. You would think, oh, it's just growing trees. I mean, how boring can growing trees be? But it really is a deep strategy game. It it you look at it and you think, ah,、oh, it's a light filler. Not only that, but it's unique in that. The trees are three D. Right, they stand up on their own, and you have little tiny trees. You have seeds.、Um, the seeds are two dimensional; they're little discs. But the little tree, the saplings, the medium sized trees, and the big trees are all three dimensional. And they came up with how to store them in the box, so you don't have to take the trees apart every time you want to put it away.、Yep. Which is one of my pet peeves when game publishers design the boxes for shipping the game, not storing the game.、Mm-hmm. Photosynthesis took storing the game into account, which I'm really pleased with. But this is just a. It's a fun game. I finally got to play it four player the last time my niece Nicole came up. And、uh, we sat down with me and Mark and Nicole and her boyfriend Kyrie, and we played this game. And I gotta say, Nicole is really a quick study at games. She always beats us the first time she plays a game with us, <laughs> and then we get her on the next time. She really picks up games quickly, and she picked up this one really quickly too. I just I love the presence on the board. The art is just gorgeous. Right. The artist is Sabrina Miramon. The designer is Halmar Hatch, and I hope I'm not butchering his name. 
Um, it came out in 2017, and my current rating of it is a 4.5, but I think the more that I play this game, the higher that rating is going to get. Each game is different depending on who you're playing and how many people you're playing with. You can play with up to four. Yeah. I haven't heard of any expansions yet, but it wouldn't surprise me if there were some. Yeah, I think there's like a promo with like a Christmas tree or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another uh, unique mechanism is that the sun goes around the board. So the sun moves in some locations, you're going to get great light. And in other locations, you're going to get shadowed. Right. And it depends on how it changes from round to round. Um, very unique take on this scientific principle. Right, right. I, I like how it integrates like education with the game as well. It tells you like, oh, you know, the, the trees gain energy from the sun. And if mm -hmm. the little trees are in the shade, well, they're not going to grow fast enough because they don't get enough sun. <laughs> it's a simple concept. Right. Then you have to save up your light points in order to be able to grow your trees. Right. It's a simple little concept, but it's really well shown like on the player board. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's photosynthesis. Again, I have yet to see anything else like it. What else have you got? Uh, the next game is called Wendake. Wendake is a game that uh, was on Kickstarter and I backed it and I received it, I think this year or last year, either the beginning or end of year. That sounds like a Native American word. It is. There's a, a Native American, uh, it's pretty much the Native American area. It's a territory that is up by the Great Lakes. And there's several different tribes in that region. And the really cool thing about this game is that there's so many games about colonists. And it's all about their perspectives. And in this case, it's not about colonists. It's all about the perspective of the Native Americans during the colonial times. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And so the cool thing is in this game, there's very little influence of the colonists, but it, it there is an influence on the colonists uh, in this game. But the main theme is how the Wendake natives, how they live their lives. The theme is great because I haven't seen any theme like that before. And the other thing is the mechanism, of course. And this is unlike any other game. And this is why I really backed it up as well. It has this, uh, on your own personal player board, you have this grid system. And this grid is, it's made up of nine different tiles, okay? These are the actions you can take in the game. And so in the beginning of the game, you take these nine tiles and you shuffle them up and then you reveal them into this grid. It's a three by three grid. And then you have these pips and these pips, you place them on a tile and then you can do the action on it. No big deal deal or anything. However, the next actions that you can also take will either have to be horizontally, vertically, or diagonally from that first pip. So it kind of limits the other actions that you can take. It's kind of like you are limited to the location of those tiles where they're randomly placed. And then after you do your three actions, you uh, will go ahead and flip them over. You can't use them again. And then the, the tiles will move down. So the bottom three tiles will come off your board. And then those three tiles, you get to pick a new advanced tile because you progress and you replace one of your old tiles with. You randomly shuffle it and then you put it on the top. So it kind of has this movement and exchange and progression of the actions that you can take, but you still have to do either horizontally, vertically, or diagonal uh, action lines. And that's a really unique thing I haven't seen in any other game. Uh, this kind of like tic-tac toe effect of of the actions you can take. The actions you take in this game are things like, according to the theme, like uh, gathering either corn or pumpkins and such. Uh, you can also go hunting and collect pelt. You can also go ahead and trade it in with some of the colonists as well. However, you do run a risk of, of catching disease from them. <laughs> that happened. Right. And also another cool thing is that it has set collection because you're trying to gain religious cards, mask. And then you also have war, these occasional battles between tribes. There's also a main board where you're you're trying to obtain space where your tribe is is kind of working with. However, other tribes might 
want to take some of that space too. So you might have a little fight, a little beef here and there. <laughs> sure, sure. That also happened too. And the cool thing too at the very end of the game is that you're trying to progress yourself along these different tracks like religion track, the economic track and such. And based upon where your pips are located, you only will score based on the farthest or the lesser amount. So you want to make sure you're equally progressing yourself. You can't just shoot off on the religion track and kind of leave everything behind. Right. You kind of have to push everything forward together. So yeah, I think this game is really great. I have not played it enough to give it a five, but it's like right there on the border of a five. Uh, I really enjoy it a lot, and I I really do want to play it more uh, before I give it that final five, but I have had a lot of fun with it. The theme is great. It's unique, as well as the mechanisms, too. Uh, this is a game that was made by uh, Danilo Sabia, and also it's Renegade Games picked this game up. Oh, okay. So this game will be available in North America They'll be going ahead and shipping it off and distributing it in during Gen Con, I believe. Oh, nice. So, yeah. So I got the Italian version of the game, but it, it has the English rules. But then Renegade picked it up as well, which is a really great thing because, you know, it's part of our history is, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in North America and all the, the natives' history as well. And we should know about these people that lived here. And, you know, I have yet to play a Renegade game that I didn't like. Right. You know, I haven't <laughs> played all their games, but the ones that I have mm. played, I have really enjoyed. That's true. Yeah, I, have, I haven't I've come to any games either that I don't like yeah. <laughs> of theirs. So that's Wendake. 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 Okay. Well, interesting that... We both picked Native American themed games because I also picked Zulkin, which is based on Mayan culture. And I picked this one specifically. I mean, it's a worker placement game. I picked it specifically for the gear mechanism in Zulkin. So on the board, there's a large central gear. And then around the board are smaller gears that are integrated with this large central gear. It's supposed to be based, I think, on the Mayan calendar which was one of the most accurate calendars until the Mayans fell. Anyway, the art on the gears is beautiful. It's just white plastic. But I have seen pictures online of people who have gone and meticulously painted out these dials. Yeah, I've seen those pictures. They're really beautiful. <laughs> oh, they're gorgeous. I recently picked up a copy again. At, I picked up a shrink wrapped copy at a flea market, which just blew me away. I think I picked it up for like 20 bucks. Wow. <laughs> I need to go to those flea markets that you're going to. <laughs> <laughs> I think this was at KublaCon. Oh. So you were there. <laughs> oh, I was there. <laughs> but you had a table, so you were busy. <laughs> I was. I, I've only played this game once, and so I'm trying to remember if it's once around or there are certain things that trigger the central gear to be turned just one notch, but it can move your workers that you've placed. So it could put them in a more advantageous spot. Or a le less ad advantageous spot. There is a rule in the game that if you don't have any workers to place, your only option is to go and take a worker off right. the board, which you may be waiting for that one worker to get to this one really prime spot, but you need to pull a worker off. Right. I thought the theming of it in Mayan culture was really well done. Yeah. Your money in this game is corn, you know, so you're trying to find ways to get corn in order to advance your uh, ability to place workers. Like I said, I've only played this once. My friend Richard Bright, hi Richard, introduced me to it and just absolutely fascinated me. And so when I saw it at a flea market, I grabbed it. Yep. That is Zulkin. It was published in 2012 by Czech Games Edition. It was designed by Simone Luciani and Daniel Tassini. It sounds, again, Italians working on these Native American-themed <laughs> games, <That's true. laughs> which is just interesting. But yeah, I absolutely give this game a 4.5, and it's that low because I've only played it once. Right. I need to play it some more. But now that I have my own copy, it's on my list to get it to the table again soon. Yeah, this is one of my top 10 games of all time. So I, lo oh, I yeah? love this game a lot. Yeah, it's really smart, well done. And the theme is just something that, you know, is not very well seen. So definitely, it's a really good game. It's a good buy that on your part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a friend that does miniature painting. And I'm wondering, 
can I get her to paint my Zulkan gear wheels? <laughs> so we'll see. But uh, it's not something that I would do myself. I just not in my wheelhouse, but yeah. I wouldn't mind having someone. Do it. <laughs> All right. What else have you got? Well, I have another game. It's a lot smaller. It's a lot simpler. Maybe it's Tokyo Highway. So um, now I have heard Ambi from Board Game Blitz talk about this one. Yeah. So this game is not from around here. It's from Japan, and uh-huh. um, and it's by the publisher of Eaton or Itten. The designer is Naotaka uh, Shimamoto and Yoshiaki um, Tomioka, I believe. Sorry about that, but <laughs> it's a 2016 game. And the really cool thing is how compact this game is. Like, this game is just a little bit bigger than the size of my hand. It's super small, compact. And what it has inside of it is not a board, but it has a whole bunch of popsicle sticks inside of it. <laughs> I, I've seen Ambie's pictures of it. I'm looking and going, popsicle sticks? Right. And then when I saw that it was called Tokyo Highway, I'm like... All right, I can see that. I can see that. <laughs> yeah, so they represent these different roads that you're trying to build, these highways, uh, this continuous highway. And what you have are these pillars, these round circular discs. And you are put placing these discs and you're trying to put them from one tip to another tip of a popsicle stick. And they're either going up or they're going down uh, from pillar to pillar. And if you happen to go over a different highway, then you get to place your cars on that. And the cars are the points. So if you manage to get rid of all of your cars, then you win. However, it becomes a little bit more congested the further you go in this game. And it then becomes a dexterity game where you're having to skillfully place these roads in between other roads or over or under roads without knocking anything down. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, this game I have a lot of fun with. It's only a two player game. And the cool thing about it is that I haven't seen anything like that where it's it's a dexterity game mixed with an abstract game where you play it. It's pretty much just on your table. There's no board to play it on. And so it depends on the shape of your table. You could play on a little table and make it even extra hard or not. But I had a lot of fun with this. It even comes with little tweezers in, in case you have uh, <laughs> big fingers. <laughs> you can also use the tweezers, which sometimes they're not that great, but you know. If, if you skillfully become like an expert at using tweezers, then, then you can, you can use them to your advantage, but I haven't found them to work very well for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a really fun game. I mean, there comes a point where you just, you know, you just kind of shake a little bit and the whole thing is over and, you know, you have, you have to, play this game all over again in order to see who the real winner was. <laughs> it's a small little compact game. I have a lot of fun with it. I think it's out of print right now. I bought my copy from the BGG store and every now and then they kind of announce it. And so if you ever hear this game being out at the BGG store, you have to jump on it as quick as you can because I think it's pretty well worth it. It's not for everyone, but I've enjoyed it. Okay, Renegade Games, this is another one you need to pick up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how, how expensive can popsicle sticks be, really? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds innovative. Yeah, yeah, it's unlike anything else. And like, you know, I could just imagine the designer like just one day, you know, eating a popsicle and coming up with the theme of this game. <laughs> And I've seen some freeway systems that look like somebody took like pickup sticks and just dropped them on the ground. And went, <laughs> right. Yep, there's our freeway system. Yep, that's pretty much LA. <laughs> yeah, there's some places here in Sacramento too that are like that. I know on I-5 and I-80, there's one particular uh, interchange where some people are trying to get onto one freeway and other people are coming off of one freeway and going onto another and the two cross. Right. <laughs> and you're like, Oh, please, let me get through this. Let me get through this. <laughs> 
So I can only imagine how crazy that's going to get. Yeah, yeah. Well, I rate this a four. The only reason I don't rate it any higher is just because it's kind of hard to convince people to play it with me because I have a lot smaller fingers than than most people. (laughs) Oh, next time we're going to be in the same convention. Please bring that game because I would love to try it. Yeah, I could definitely bring it in my bag because it's so small. (laughs) Nice, nice. All right. Well, before I go on to my last game that I want to talk about, I want to mention uh, some of the honorable mentions that Annette and I have compiled, and this is in no particular order. I would say that Gloomhaven is a unique game. A, the box weighs 21 pounds, wow. and it is it is a legacy style game, but it's unique in that you develop characters to a certain level, uh-huh. and then you retire them and you start over again. Yeah. Now, there's things that you carry on from you know from that other character into into the next character but your character's retired he's gone he's gone off to go farm or something i don't know <laughs> retired <laughs> um yeah but i'm i've never had a game where you retire your character it has at least a couple of dozen scenarios to play through mm-hmm. it's just you can tell there was so much thought and planning put into this game. Another one is time stories. I've never seen time travel done the way that time stories does it. Uh, They basically put you into this machine and your, your spirit, your essence, whatever, gets transferred into someone else's body back in time. I've never seen time travel handled that way. Usually it's your body is going to that time. Right. And they don't cover the fact that there are diseases back there that your body doesn't have immunity to, oh. or vice versa, that you could be bringing something that nobody back then has immunity to. Um, it's just not something that the authors ever consider when they're writing these stories. Yeah. Time Stories did take that into account, and they came up with this alternative way of doing it. Another one, I've heard a couple of different people say, Twilight Imperium is absolutely unique. There is nothing out there quite like it. Yeah. Have you played Twilight Imperium? I haven't. I'm afraid of it. (laughs) It's so long. (laughs) You know what? I played it at RageCon uh, a few weeks ago, and it lasted four and a half hours. Oh, okay. It was scheduled from noon to midnight, Yeah. but it was over in four and a half hours. Now that's Twilight Imperium 4, which is the new revision. Uh And I'm told that it's really been streamlined. So it's not going to last as long. (laughs) They suggest it's about an hour per player is how long it's going to last. And I was playing in a four player game. Oh, wow. That's pretty precise. (laughs) Yeah. Now, when I played Twilight Imperium 3, that was a four or five player game. And it lasted about six and a half hours. So... And I, I have seen people play it for 12 plus hours. Yeah. So not that I've participated in. I know my roommate played it and it mm-hmm. took them eight hours and they had to pack up and go because the room was yep. reserved yep. for someone else and they didn't finish. <laughs> I've had that happen with a Firefly game one time too. Long games can really go long sometimes. Mysterium, yep. having a character who can't talk and is trying to give clues That's different. That's unique. Yeah. I would say that other than Seven Wonders Duel, Seven Wonders is still a very unique game, even though it's been out for quite some time. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I I mean, it's been out for so long and so many games have evolved from it and just the card Mm -hmm. drafting aspect of it and the buildup of it, like engine building uh, round by round. And yet it's a quick playing game. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been out for quite a while. It's still, there's so many expansions for it too. And and Uh the duel too. But um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it was a unique game at its time. Definitely. I have not seen any other games similar to Flashpoint Fire Rescue. Have you ever played that one? I have. (laughs) <laughs> it's stressful. <laughs> <laughs> it can be, yeah. But would you agree that there aren't many other games like it? Yeah, I am thinking about it and I don't play very many co-ops, but yeah, I remember enjoying that one and remembering that game. I mean, it left an impact. I haven't played it in years, but I haven't come close to any game like that as well where you're having to, to try to get out of a burning <laughs> house. <laughs> well, not only that, but you, you're playing characters that are running into the burning right. house to rescue people, right. which is, you know, what firefighters do. I've seen a couple of other firefighter themed games, but none like Flashpoint. It's just 
very different. I also added Outpost Mm -hmm. to the list. I don't know too much about this game. In Outpost, you're all playing on an asteroid or a moon. Uh, You know, you each have your own. And you're trying to build these factories to harvest these resources, to sell them back to Earth to earn money. But I've never seen it done in quite the same way that Outpost does it. When you're paying for something, you have to pay exact change. There's no change. Mm. There are some mechanisms where you can't buy a certain resource unless you have a combination of resources. So, for example, in order to buy, there's one type of science that you have to have at least one other color of money. I mean, you can use whatever colors you want, but you have to have at least one um, I think it's one yellow card. Uh-huh. You may have all the, the money necessary to buy it numbers wise. But if you don't have that one color of money, you're not going to get it. Huh. It's also got an auction mechanic where you're trying to buy the resources that you need in order to advance things. Mm-hmm. But the way those resources come out is different. You're rolling a die. And what die you're rolling depends on some various conditions in the game and you're either rolling a d4 i want to say a d12 or or maybe it's a d10 and a, a d20 and it just depends on what's going on in the game right. as to which die gets rolled hmm. so you know which resources come out it's it's an unusual game huh. i think i've played it probably at least 12 to 18 times oh, and wow. i think i've won once <laughs> we have a shorthand for it in our game group we call it math because you have to do math in order to figure out how much you're going to bid on everything. You're just sitting there going, okay, I've got, you know, the cards each have different uh, denominations on it. The cards are your money, but you may have money from water mining that has like one, seven, six, eight, ten on each of these different cards. And you have to sit there and add up how much do I have in water money and how much do I have in ore money. And, oh, wow. And each each set of money has its own average. Like I said, I've just never seen anything similar to it. Huh. You added Mystic Veil. I haven't played Mystic Veil. Do you want to talk about that one a little bit? Yeah, that one's a, a pretty unique game. Uh, I think several games have come out since then like it. But when it first came out, it was a game that used transparent cards. And there's been another game like Gloom. Uh, and mm-hmm. Gloom also had de- uh, clear cards. However, in Mystic Veil, vale, it was a deck builder where you have a sleeve and you put these transparent cards in and you're building your deck, but you're also crafting your cards. So you're not really obtaining more cards. You're just upgrading and evolving your cards. So you, you like the same number of cards that you start with you'll have that many at the end of the game and you're just developing your cards and that's how it progresses. Uh, so that one, that one's been really, I've, I really enjoy it. It's a two to four player game and it has multiple expansions by this point. But yeah, it's, it's kind of like Star Realms in a way or like Splendor where the market kind of like is out there randomly. Oh, okay. And uh, and you take cards to craft your cards with, but then also it has a press your luck element to it. So it's a really unique game with the, just the card crafting itself. And like I said, several card games have come up like that. The other game I also mentioned too, uh, as an honorable mention, was Kodama Tree Spirits. Kodama is a game that you lay your cards down on the table and what they represent are tree limbs to this trunk that you have. And so you have to build a tree and these cards that you're, you're choosing from the center either have different figures on them, like little caterpillars or little flowers or fireflies and such or clouds. And so you're collecting the card, but you also have to make sure that it kind of fits with the arrangement of what you've already placed. So like mm. one tree, like branch can't go over another tree branch. And it's all based on the shape of the card and where that branch is drawn on that card. So, yeah, that one's definitely a a unique uh, type of game that I haven't seen many other games use use the layover of cards onto one another. I think there's several other ones like Honshu, but it's more of a grid. It's not free play with the cards. And there's another little game that's 
part of the button shy games that I'm forgetting. I'm blanking out on that game. But yeah, there's not that many card games where you just overlay cards onto one hmm. another. Another one that I have not yet played, but I've heard so many good things about it that I went and bought a copy of it from a vendor this time. It was not a it was not a uh, flea market find. Um, and that is Dice Forge. Have you pl- had a chance to play Dice Forge yet? No, no. I've heard about it, but I haven't played You're it yet. You're building your dice. Uh-huh. And I've never seen a mechanism like that before. And not only can you build your dice, but you can change your dice. You can take a face off and, and replace it with another face. Yeah. So, I mean, I've never seen a mechanism like that before. And then the last one that I want to mention that I have played several times and just absolutely enjoy is Gloom. And you had mentioned that with the clear cards. I had never seen the clear cards like that before. I think it's a little different from Mystic Veil in that you're laying the cards on the table and you're stacking them on and you can either enhance your own cards or you can devalue your opponent's cards. So you can lay your card on your opponent's cards to devalue them or outright kill their characters. And you can also tell a story too. (laughs) <laughs> and you're telling a story at the same time yeah. about why this person is so miserable. I mean, that's why it's called gloom, because, yeah. you know, it's it's very Adam's Family-esque, where everything is just awful all the time, <laughs> you know. Um, but occasionally good things happen, and, and that can uh, move your, your gloom score more towards the positive than the negative. So, and then the last game that I was going to talk about a little more in depth is XCOM by Eric Lang. And the reason I added this one is because the game is run by an app. You can't play this game without the app. Unlike One Night Ultimate Werewolf, which has the fantastic app that was voiced by Eric Summer from the Dice Tower, which I I won't play One Night Ultimate Werewolf without the app. Yeah. Um, But you can. You can have someone just narrate it. XCOM, you cannot play without the app because it runs everything. It's 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 running an alien invasion and the characters are playing the military responding to this alien invasion. And so each of the characters takes their turn and then the app goes. Yeah. And it randomizes things, so it's going to be different every time. You know, sometimes it's it's going to be a benevolent aliens coming down and you're reacting to it i think that's what i was that's what what it was explained to me uh we did not have a benevolent one when i played it we were you know fighting an alien invasion i had never seen a game like that before and i haven't seen one like it since um but it was absolutely a a unique experience and very fun yeah fun very stressful (laughs) Yes. Oh my gosh. I think I played that one once. And uh, yeah, it stressed me out. Like you have to prepare yourself for that game. <laughs> the same thing yeah. with the with the Sonic game. Um, What's it called? The submarine game. Oh, uh, Captain Sonar. Yes. Captain yes, Sonar. I played that one recently that too. And it, stressful. <laughs> it, it can be. Yeah. Yeah. I was on the losing side of, of that oh, one no. <laughs> at um, RageCon. That was, but that was fun. Yeah, and XCOM, it, like, it uses that app. I think there's multiple games that now have since used the app, but I agree, it's it's unique where you can't even play the game without it. I think um, there's also Alchemist, which also uses the app, but it's just, you could play that game, just one person has to sit out. <laughs> oh. Yeah, which is no fun. <laughs> yeah, and of course there are games where you're playing against the game, and, you know, the game has specific rules. Uh, one that I can think of is Zombicide. Everybody takes their turn and then the zombies go. But I just I hadn't seen anything where the app was running the game and you had to respond to it. And um, the person that was basically running the app would enter your responses into the app and then the app would respond based on you had all done. Yeah. Uh, collectively. So so what are your favorite unique games? Reach out to us on Twitter or Facebook uh, or Board Game Geek in our guild on Board Game Geek, guild number 2600. And let us know what your favorite unique games are. I'm sure there are many, many more. 
This episode is sponsored by BoardGameTables.com. Hi, this is Kathy. As I mentioned on previous episodes, Mark and I have purchased a table from our sponsor, BoardGameTables.com. We are very excited to take delivery on this handcrafted piece of furniture. Neither of us has ever designed a custom piece of furniture before now. We were able to pick the shape, the type of wood, the color of the stain, the color of the felt, and the features like cup holders and a table topper. I'm sure that BoardGameTables.com has the perfect options and features to craft just the right table for you, your family, and your game group. You can browse their site and pick the options you want at BoardGameTables.com. Please let them know you heard about it on Our Turn, Gaming for Everyone. All right, so now we're at the part of the show where we're winding things down and looking ahead. Annette, what have you got on your plate for the next week or two? Well, tomorrow I have this game that I'm going to play. It's called Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. I've heard good things about that one. I have too, and I I don't know. I It's the first time I'm playing it. I'm going to play it online. Um, I'm going to play it with um, Ace. And with Nicole, they both are on Twitter and and um, and Instagram and and such. And so, uh, Ace lives in Dallas, Texas, and Nicole lives in uh, in Toronto. And so, Mitch and I are going to join them, and we're going to have nice. this like online game of consulting detective, which they sent us the newspaper. And so I have to read up on it and try to figure out the clues on this newspaper. And then uh, we're going to meet up tomorrow online, I think through Skype or something. There's this platform called Roll20. Uh-huh. I've heard of it. Okay. And it's mainly used for like RPG games where you can have a map mm-hmm. and then you can have your characters move on the map and you can play it like over Skype or something. So we're going to do that, but with this board game. And <laughs> so nice. it should be fun. I don't know. I've never done anything like this. I'm not running it. I'm just kind of like going to follow through and, and they're going to teach me. And so, and it's a really great way to kind of uh, meet up with them who I never really see because they live so far. <laughs> so it's a great way to just kind of like play a game online with friends. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be tomorrow. Um, we're, I'm also going to be a part of Gen Cant, which is, uh, unfortunately I can't go to Gen Con and I know that's coming up. So lots of people are excited and, and happy about it happening, but I'm kind of just still at home. It's just any other day. <laughs> <laughs> but So what are you doing with Gen Cant? But Gen Cant there, I don't know if you've participated with Gen Cant before, but there's like games online that you can follow, uh, try to get a high score, like in a solo game. There's also this competition, like a design competition that happened. And mm-hmm. so uh, people competed to have these, uh, this one 18 card game. And oh, so, is that what they're doing this year? Yeah. So a bunch of people kind of try to design an 18 card game. And then at, during Gen Cat, they announced the winner and then you can print and play it. So uh, I know Sarah Reed participated in that last year. They did roll and write games last right. year. Yeah. She didn't win, but uh, I was really proud of her for coming up with something and submitting it. That was that was fantastic. Yeah. It's a nice little challenge. They have panels of judges who play all of the games that are submitted. And I think last year they had like 100 games submitted, 100 roll and write games submitted. And all of these judges go through and they play all of the games. I know. I have several friends that are a part of the judge panel. And they're just, I don't know how they do it. Because they have to interpret (laughs) the rules. They have to read all those rules. And then they have to play them. And they have to find the people to play them with. (laughs) Uh uh And then then kind of analyze, well, which one did I really like and not? And kind of like organize their favorites. That's hard. (laughs) Do you remember the dates uh, for Gen Con and Gen Cant? I know they go simultaneously. Uh, No, I don't. I think it's at the end of the month. Uh, I'm not going to Gen Con, so I'm not so excited about it. But whenever Gen Con's happening, I'm there. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So on my plate, uh, next weekend is Midsummer Conquest. So you've heard me talk about 
uh, Conquest SAC and Conquest Avalon. Well, this is going to be the first year for Midsummer Conquest. It's put on by the same people um, that do the other two conventions. And it's being held at the same place that they've held the last couple of conventions, which is at the McClellan Event Center. And so I am actually running three games. Um, I'm running Unfair, Photosynthesis, and what was my third one? Oh, Firefly Adventures, uh, Brigands and Brown Coats. So I'm running all three of those on Friday and Saturday. I'm running Unfair on Friday. And, oh, and I also might be running Red Dragon Inn. I had initially signed up to do Unfair on Saturday, and then I moved it to Friday, but their system duplicated it rather than moved it. Uh -huh. So I told them I can't run Unfair on Saturday, but if you want me to still run something, I'll run Red Dragon Inn, which is a nice, short, easy game. Right. Um that I could get in before I run photosynthesis. So I always enjoy going to these cons. They're fun. I enjoy teaching games. I enjoy playing games. So we'll see how this one goes. It's the first year for it. I've never been to a first year con before. Yeah. Sounds like so, fun. Yeah. And then the other game that I'm playing right now, which sadly it's not as much fun as something like photosynthesis or uh, Firefly Adventures, I am playing the moving game. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, we are moving. Uh, we're actually moving across Sacramento County to Citrus Heights. We, uh, we haven't been too enamored with our current complex, apartment complex management. And um, my husband, Mark, got a job in Folsom, which is clear on the other side of the county from Sacramento. So right now at 3.30 in the morning, which is when he hits the road to go to work, uh, he has about a 40 minute commute at 3:30 in the morning. Um, so this will literally have have the time that he's on the road. So that is a good thing. And um, this new complex is really nice. We're moving into a cottage, which means that we're not going to have any upstairs neighbors. Yay! <laughs> we're only sharing one wall with one neighbor. And uh, we have a nice little place behind the complex or behind our apartment where we can let the girls go and run, our dogs go and run. So I think it's going to be a good move for us. But moving is always such a chore. <laughs> yeah. You don't like pushing cubes? <laughs> <laughs> it's filling the cubes first. You know, yeah. <laughs> I, we're actually hiring someone to push them around for us. Oh, good. Um, you know, move them from one place to another. And then it's emptying the cubes when you get to the other end. Um, unfortunately, the point system just isn't that great for it. I think it needs a lot more play testing. Unfortunately, I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm doing the play testing right now. Hopefully it's done after one play. <laughs> yeah, hopefully it'll be done for a while, which I think it will be. We're both really pleased with this new complex. So anyway, um, how can people get a hold of you online, Annette? Well, uh, you can find me all over the internet as Netters Play. So I am on Twitter and I'm on Instagram and Facebook as well as YouTube. And I'm also part of the Dice Tower Board Game Breakfast. So I submit a segment every week for them and that is up every Monday. And so, uh, yeah, you could find me there. I'm always collaborating with people just like this. <laughs> so and I I noticed that you got your own dice figure for the die from the dice I tower, did. and Gizmo is included. <laughs> he well, he is a part of the dice tower, so it makes sense. Yes, he's included. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I'm really happy with it. Tom surprised me with it. He he mentioned that he would you know to submit some pictures, and I was like, okay, why? And also of Gizmo, and then uh, and then he surprised me with it, and it was really cute. <laughs> it is. It's adorable. It's yeah, adorable. I love it. All right. And uh, you can find me uh, all over the internet as Our Turn Podcast. Uh, we're on Twitter as Our Turn Podcast, Instagram, and Facebook. And Sarah Reed runs the Facebook page, and I manage the Twitter account. And we also have a guild on Board Game Geek, which is guild number 2600. And um, oh, and you can also find the show notes for this episode by going to OurTurnPodcast.com slash episode 82. Annette, thank you for joining me for this episode. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I always have a great time whenever I'm chatting with you. <laughs> oh, good. I'm so glad. And um, I 
I can't wait for you to come back again sometime. Sure. I'll be back anytime. All right. On behalf of the entire Our Turn podcast crew, that was our turn. And now it's yours. Thank you for listening. This episode was recorded on July 14th, 2018, and is written and produced by Kathy Ford and Annette Via with assistance from Mark Ford. We want and encourage your questions, comments, and feedback. Please call 916-426-2873 and leave us a short voicemail or send an email to feedback at OurTermPodcast.com. Our theme music was composed by Adriana Crickle. Incidental music was provided by Purple Planet Music. Please check out our show notes to learn more about these talented artists. The material in this episode is copyrighted under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. If you want to learn more about the games discussed in this episode, please visit our website at OurTurnPodcast.com slash episode 82. You can find a list of the games along with links to their listing on BoardGameGeek.com. We are proud members of the Dice Tower Network. You can find out about other shows on the network like Flip Flory's Super Saturday Board Game Serial, the Board Game Design Lab, or Every Night is Game Night by going to DicetowerNetwork.com. Thank you for your support. If you like what you heard, please tell your friends about us.